At the Sports History Network, we're proud to introduce you to a new sponsor for our podcasts. It's Home Field Apparel, your premium collegiate apparel brand right out of Indianapolis. They've got incredibly comfortable t-shirts, plus they're officially licensed with vintage college designs. They have over 150 plus colleges available now and always adding more. Homefield digs through the archives and history of your school to find unique logos, mascots, and moments to make thoughtful designs for your school. When you shop today, new customers can get a 15% discount off their first purchase using the promo code SPORTSHISTORY at checkout. You can learn more at homefieldapparel.com. Thanks for listening to the Pigskin Tales podcast. This story was written and produced by Ross Blyley, edited by Nikki Blyley. To support the podcast, join me on Patreon. You can find the podcast on any platform you want, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Audible. If you like the story, help me out by doing a quick review. This will help others to want to listen. The soundtrack is from filmmusic.io. Once again, thanks for listening to the Pigskin Tales podcast. This episode is sponsored by Homefield Apparel. At Homefield, we know college, and we know what it's like to be part of something bigger than you. We create unique, premium collegiate apparel that shows you're a part of a community while still standing out from the crowd. Whether you're on campus or off, our high-quality goods are thoughtfully made and designed to last as long as your memories do. You can save 15% off your first order when you use the promo code SPORTSHISTORY at checkout. Hey friends, on the last episode of the podcast, I wrote a short story on Dave Casper. He was a -a one-of-a-kind guy who played with the Raiders, Vikings, and Oilers. He was born in Bemidji, Minnesota, but grew up in the woods of Wisconsin. Don't take that literally, folks. Please. He won a Super Bowl with the Raiders in 1975 and became the ninth best tight end in NFL history. This time, the tale is about an average Joe from White Earth, Minnesota. He grew up in the same era as Jim Thorpe, played fullback on offense and sideback on defense. Later, the position was renamed to defensive halfback, according to him. This is Pigskin Tales. The story of Joe Big Chief Guyan. There is no argument about the identity of the greatest football player who ever performed in Dixie. There is a grand argument about second place, but for first place there is Joe Guyon, the Chippewa Brave. Ralph McGill, Atlanta sports newspaper publisher and author, from the book NFL 100, A Century of Pro Football. Joseph Napoleon Guyon Jr was born on the White Earth Indian Reservation in White Earth, Minnesota on November the 26th in 1892. He was part of the Chippewa tribe. His Indian name was Oji Chida, which means Big Chief. According to the website findagrave.com, his parents were Joseph Napoleon Guyon Sr. and Mary Mindamona Guyon. Joe Jr. married Charlotte Lee Arbogast in 1921 and gave birth to a girl, Geraldine, in 1919. Switching topics from family to location, according to the White Earth Nation website, the White Earth Reservation is located in Becker, Clearwater, and Monoman counties in north-central Minnesota. Created in 1876 by a treaty between the United States and the Mississippi Band of Chippewa Indians, it is one of seven Chippewa reservations in Minnesota. According to his Pro Football Hall of Fame profile, Guyon received a sixth grade education from the American government. He once said that, quote, It was hard trying to make something of yourself, 
Sports were one of the few ways a youngster could pull himself up, end quote. The Big Chief was 5'11 and 190. At the time, he played two different positions because he was so much bigger than most other athletes. In 1912, Joe played football for the Carlisle Industrial School for Indians in Pennsylvania for two seasons. According to the book, The Great Book of Football, Interesting Facts and Sports Stories, co-written by Bill O'Neill and Ryan Black, quote, At any other college, Joe Guyon would have been the best there ever was. When it came to Carlisle Indian Industrial School, he wasn't even the best guy on his own team. That's because Guyon played in the same era at the same school as Jim Thorpe, who many believe to be the greatest athlete this country has ever known, end quote. Thorpe and Guyon played for the legendary head coach Glenn Pop Warner. Thorpe was the featured guy who quarterbacked the team and Guyon played left tackle, opening gaping holes in the defensive line allowing Thorpe to slash and dash his way through four huge gains. Once during a 1912 game against Army, a game that featured future United States President Dwight D. Eisenhower, and first-team All-American Leland DeVore, DeVore got so frustrated at Guyon that he was ejected from the game. In 1913, when Thorpe left for the pros, Guyon took over as halfback and the team went 10-1-1. After a short stint with the Carlisle Industrial School, Joe went on to play halfback for two seasons at Keewatin Academy in 1914. According to an excerpt from the book Duke Slater, pioneering black NFL player and judge, Guyon was a captain on the team and was there to gain additional credits to regain college eligibility. Once, in a game against Clinton High School in 1914, Guyon scored on a 15-yard crisscross play from his days at Carlisle to make the score 14-7, and then later in the same game scored a 10-yard touchdown on the same play to make the game 21-7. Nearing the end of the game, Clinton halfback Nips Murphy smashed into Guyon at the Clinton 2-yard line and fumbled. On the ensuing possession, Kiwatin scored to make it 27-7. The next day, the local newspaper gave credit to the Clinton team for putting up a good hard-fought fight in the first half, but fell just short in the second half when Guyon and Barrett stepped up and made big plays. According to the website Sports Collectors Digest, after the 1915 season, while on his way to visit a North Carolina school that had offered him a scholarship, Guyon stopped in Atlanta where his older brother Charles, himself was a football star at the Haskell Institute and Carlisle, was an assistant under head football coach John Heisman at Georgia Tech. Guyon decided to matriculate at Tech. He became part of Heisman's dream team backfield, and when he wasn't carrying the ball himself, he was clearing the way for others. Ralph McGill, Atlanta sports writer, said of Guyon, they could follow that big fella and run to glory because he cleared the way, and I mean he cleared it. Another writer said, survivors of the teams Tech played in those days still shudder to recall the multiple impacts when Guyon blocked or tackled them, and he could punt more than 60 yards consistently, place kick from midfield and pass with the best. In the 1917 season, Georgia Tech went undefeated and crushed their opponents 491-17. to In one game versus Vanderbilt, Guyon ran the ball 12 times for almost 350 yards. In 1918, Georgia Tech was 6-1 and won the SIAA championship. Guyon was selected as an All-American tackle. This podcast is sponsored by the Sports History Network, your headquarters for sports yesteryear. Show some love for your favorite Sports History Network podcast. 
Now Open is a merch shop just for you. If you're looking for a unique gift for a birthday or Christmas that's just around the corner, check out the Sports History Network store. You can get coffee mugs, t-shirts, and even podcaster books. Check it out at shopsportshistorynetwork.com. In his first season as a pro, Guyan and the Bulldogs went 9-0-1 and won the league championship. The next season, Canton was the first team to be part of the American Professional Football Association, which now is the National Football League as of 1922. Bob Lemke, the author of the article titled An Overlooked NFL Giant, Joe Guyan, posted on the Sports Collectors Digest website on July 19, 2010, cites that from 1919 to 1924, Guyan and Thorpe played side by side. They both played for four different teams, the Canton Bulldogs, the Cleveland Indians, the Oorang Indians, and the Rock Island Independents. They had a combined win-loss record of 12, 23, and 2. In 1925, Guyan played for the Kansas City Cowboys while Thorpe stayed with Rock Island. Guyan and the Cowboys were severely disappointed with their season as they went 2, 5, and 1. Since Guyan was playing minor league baseball at the same time as playing professional football, he opted to play the majority of the 1926 season with the Louisville Colonels. He batted 343 with 36 doubles, 13 triples, 132 runs, 86 RBI, 209 hits, and 21 stolen bases. A near identical statistical season from the one he had in 1925. In 1927, he still played minor league baseball for Louisville, but he also played pro football for the New York Football Giants. He was reunited with his former teammate Thorpe, and they ended up winning the NFL championship that season, going 11-1-1. Guyan once told a reporter that season that he did everything but sell programs. Lemke wrote in his article that Guyan played guard, tackle, blocking back, which would be fullback in modern terms, tailback, and punter. To close out his professional football career and hopes to play in the MLB, Guyan played in 25 games for Louisville. During one game, he ran into the fence to catch a fly ball and injured his knee. Afterward, the injury ended his playing days. When it was decided that he could not play sports anymore due to a serious knee injury, he had a backup plan. From 1928 to 1931, he became the head coach of the Clemson Tigers baseball team and had a win-loss record of 42-36-3. Mr. Lemke ended his article on Joe Guyon discussing his life after professional sports. Quote, Following his playing days, he lived for a time in Hara, Oklahoma, and from 1954 to 62 in Flint, Michigan, where he was a bank guard. A fellow Georgia Tech alum who knew Joe Guyon after his playing days, Joseph P. Byrd III, said of Guyon, quote, Though a terror on the football field, off the field, Joe was a gentleman, lighthearted, bright, animated, and witty. Unquote. He returned to Louisville in 1968, where he lived out his days, dying there a day after his 79th birthday. Original, unquote. In the book NFL 100, A Century of Pro Football, Myron Cope took a quote from Joe Guyon from The Game That Was in 1969. Joe says in his own words, quote, I played halfback on offense, and on defense, I played sideback, which I suppose is what they later started calling defensive halfback. I had more damn tricks, and brother, I could hit you. Elbows, knees, or whatchamacallit. Boy, I could use them. And it's true that I used to laugh like the Dickens when I saw other players get injured. Self-protection is the first thing they should have learned. You take care of yourself, you know? I think it's a sin if you don't. It's a rough game, so you got to equip yourself and know what to do. The games that were real scraps were the ones in Chicago. 
George Hallis was a brawler. There'd be a fight every time we met those sons of biscuits. Hallis knew that I was the key man. He knew that getting me out of there would make the difference. I was playing offense one time and I saw him coming from a long ways off. I was always alert, but I pretended I didn't see him. When I got close, I wheeled around and nailed him, broke three of his ribs. And as they carted him off, I said to him, What the hell, Hallis? Don't you know you can't sneak up on an Indian? Mr. Guyon was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1966 and the College Football Hall of Fame in 1971. At his enshrinement in 1976, Jim Konzelman introduced Guyon and said, I think it's about time we honor an Indian instead of shooting them. Konzelman goes on to recap Guyon's illustrious pro football career. Afterwards, Mr. Guyon then steps up to the mic and thanks everyone, including Konzelman, and begins his thank you speech by saying, quote, I'm going to greet you like Christopher Columbus was greeted when he landed at Plymouth Rock. Greetings, immigrants and friends. I am really happy to be here, especially here at Campton, where they do things up great, and I'm very appreciative of this honor, and I'll always remember you. Thank you so much. Unquote. Thanks for listening to the Pigskin Tales podcast. This story was written and produced by Ross Blyley, edited by Nikki Blyley. To support the podcast, join me on Patreon. You can find the podcast on any platform you want, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Audible. If you like the story, help me out by doing a quick review. This will help others to want to listen. The soundtrack is from filmmusic.io. Once again, thanks for listening to the Pigskin Tales podcast. I put up my replica 1909 World Series program poster from Row One Brand, and that's all it took for Marla to do a complete redesign of the Guardian offices, doing up the walls with tremendous prints from baseball, football, basketball, hockey, and more sports events. And every one of them can't help but trigger memories of sports yesteryear. And here's the last one. Let's put it up here by your desk. Perfect. Ah, oh, that's a nice one. College football, 1923. Navy versus Penn State. Do you remember that game, Marla? I sure do. It was October 20th, 1923. Cloudy, but a reasonable 57 degrees at the 2.30 kickoff time. Over 20,000 turned out at Beaver Field in College Station, Pennsylvania for this clash of two of the nation's top teams. The Nittany Lions were the underdogs, despite having won their first three games by a combined score of 94 to nothing. The heavy favorites were the midshipmen, who went on to play in the Rose Bowl after the season. Right, and the game immediately became... The entire color of the game would ultimately be dominated by Penn State's star halfback, Harry Wilson. But both offenses took some time to get going for a good 22 minutes before Wilson got the crowd to their feet with an interception of Bill McKee's forward pass, returning it all the way for his first touchdown of the day. Wilson certainly was great On the that. next kickoff, who would end up as returner but Harry Wilson? Wilson dodged at least a half dozen Recall the greatest moments in sports history, or just your own personal favorites, with Row One Brand Sports Paraphernalia. Don't delay. Visit today at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full Row One catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan. When the gun Sports started to mark the end of the game, the score remained Penn State 14, Navy 0. The second half had barely begun when Harry Wilson and Penn State went on to work on Navy again.